for the next couple of minutes. Hi, this is student Dr. Ways. I'm going to walk you through case number one. I'm just going to read to you and then ask you some questions as we go along. So, <clears throat> uh, case number one starts, you are a 55 year old black man who was recently diagnosed with stage one multiple myeloma. You have undergone multiple chemotherapy cycles in the past two months. Worsening joint and back pain are becoming unbearable and you frequently have days where moving and walking are agonizing. Though you have previously um, Though you have had previous conversations about your pain uh, intensity, your oncologist continues to recommend acetaminophen and NSAIDs, which provide little relief. You decide to meet with your oncologist again to discuss alternative pain treatments. Continuing on to the next slide, after an hour long wait, you're able to see the physician. You discuss several, you discuss severe, severe bone pain. Um, that you've experienced, which you describe as excruciating. The oncologist tells you that other patients on similar chemotherapy agents have not reported this level of pain, adding that perhaps the pain is not as bad as you perceive it to be, and you should continue taking acetaminophen for the time being. How would you respond as the patient? A, continue to take acetaminophen. B, insist on pain treatment alternatives. Or C, continue the appointment and look or conclude the appointment and look for another oncologist. So A, B, or C, and you can feel free to either answer in the chat, responding to the panelists, or we can put up a poll for you guys if you like. All right, and we're just gonna move on from that first question because this is um, gonna be a continuation. So we just wanna see your mode of thinking as you progress through the case. So. You actually decide to ask for alternative pain medication, so you chose you chose B, um, and so um, you ask about oxycodone, and the oncologist states that due to the high abuse potential of opioids, he is not comfortable prescribing them and prefers and prefers to recommend non-opioid analgesics. However, you are aware of other chemotherapy patients receiving oxycodone, so how would you respond now with the patient, knowing other patients receive oxycodone? Would you bring up the fact that other patients have been prescribed uh, opioids? Would you say nothing? Um, the physician probably has his reasons. Or C, would you discuss non-opioid analgesic options? So this time around, I'm getting a couple of A's. So a couple of people are, are self-advocating right away, which is, which is great. So continuing case number one, next slide. You state that other patients have told you about their moderate pain relief after taking opioids. The oncologist replies that each patient case is unique and there are other um, different reasons for prescribing all opioids to patients. He goes on to say, your patient history does not make a good candidate for opioids. He's brought up that in the past, you have a history of cocaine use from college. And you reiterate that you haven't used anything, or I'm sorry, and that you haven't used the substance since. You reiterate this to the oncologist and he insists on a trial and you insist on a trial of opioid therapy. So again, you insist on a trial of opioid therapy after having to prove that you haven't used substances since college. Next slide. The oncologist asks if you're currently taking opioids to which you answer no. The oncologist says he would like to perform, um, he would like to confirm by searching your medical history in the state prescription drug monitoring program. You give your permission and he quickly searches the database. The oncologist finally agrees and writes a prescription for an initial seven day course of low dose oxycodone. You drive to your local pharmacy, you feel a sense of relief in that exasperation. Did it have to be this difficult to obtain your prescription? You could just say yes or no in the chat. Um, just give your opinion. Um, if you've experienced this, some people might say yes. So don't don't feel like it's this is an awkward situation if, if uh, this is unfamiliar to you or if you've been placed in this situation. So um, again, going to um, go to the next slide, please. All right, so case number one, this is um, at the pharmacy. Um, you learn that opioids are not routinely kept in stock. The pharmacist calls the other local pharmacies and none have oxycodone in stock. What will you do? A, return to the clinic and ask for a different pain medication. B, try calling pharmacies in other towns. Or C, take an over-counter and see them in. 
got some A's and B's coming in, A's and B's. So again, this is a tricky, this isn't, there's no right answer to this. I mean, how far, which, which town do we live in? Do we live in Vineland, South Jersey, where the pharmacy's 40 minutes away, or do we live in nice Voorhees, New Jersey, where there's multiple pharmacies in a 10 mile radius? So continue uh, to the next slide, please. So this, these are really tough questions. So the discussion for you guys, I wanna ask you some poignant questions here. Um, these these disparities are very real, and um, you know it's it's kind of like a, a little mock scenario. But at the same time, this 55 year old male with multiple myeloma has extensive bone lesions and vertebral collapse. And if you're a medical student, you know that uh, lytic bone lesions come with this type of cancer, and it can be debilitating, similar to like a um, just like a brittle bone syndrome where you are have like easy. Um, uh, fractures and things like that. So recurrent pain episodes and um, you know, even related to the cancer and chemotherapy are frequent and should be treated um, according to multiple standards. Um, but it, and again, in this case, it seems like this patient's pain was dismissed, not necessarily even taken seriously as it should have been considering this patient has cancer um, that, that literally deteriorates your bone. So as a fact, most African-American cancer patients are 70% less likely to receive opioid prescriptions than their counterparts. Um, even after controlling for insurance and, and other um, variables like that. So, um, and statistics increase if Blacks have a history of drug use in their path. So, it, it's, ha it's hard for Black patients, and some of these barriers that we've seen are, are there when we talk about resistance to prescribing opioids, which some uh, physicians might feel because in the current opioid epidemic, you don't want to get flagged. Um, but at the same time, Denying a patient based on your inherent or internal bias isn't necessarily appropriate either. So um, apparently, it like it like you would like to think that there was impaired access to care. It's a toss up, right? But I want to give you guys a little bit more data to kind of think about and, and see how you know. For one, the the dismissive part. Yes, he was very dismissive of the patient's pain because he could have offered some type of alternative therapy, even osteo osteopathic therapy or um, physical therapy, right? us being OMM doctors, but I put together a couple of journal readings that I wanna just read for you guys, um, and I'll share them in the chat. This first one is from 2005. It's from an Oxford, Oxford University um, pain journal. And it just says that um, disparities related to pain can just be perceived um, um, levels of pain. So not necessarily really to, do, to the intensity. So I pretty much put in layman terms. If uh, blacks were able to perceive their control over their pain, they would be able to bear and manage through their daily activities of living despite the This was a published journal. This was published in 2005. Now, I just want to show you guys the question of how this thinking continues. It's going to take about two more minutes. Um, and so you can see here um, in 2007 from the um, Tennessee College of Medicine, when race matters, they started to try and uncover how even though patients had comorbidities, it was unlikely that patients or that physicians were correlating the patient's pain in an appropriate way to their care plan. So you definitely need to incorporate their pain, whether or not they're saying diabetic foot ulcers or even if multiple myeloma, whatever, as a part of their care plan and not just put it as the backseat. Um, and unfortunately, um, it, it led to pain being um, the, the kind of like the side burner where it took it taking a backseat. And so here you can now see how implicit bias starts to come more to the forefront when we're talking about life-saving therapies and thrombolysis. Um, this is a Harvard study that showed that doctors perceived um, perceived uh, knowledge about the way Blacks express their pains and their perception of Black people in pain led them to withhold life-saving therapy. Thrombolysis is something that you can give when someone's having a heart attack um, or even a um, stroke it's indicated for. And so now we can see all the way up to 2020 and 2019, I'll put these last two journals um, from the AAMC, um, where they started to acknowledge how um, inherent bias is negatively impacting the entire medical field. And so, you know, there's inherent bias where, you know, Blacks just discriminately don't feel pain or have less, have thicker skin or have decreased um, pain sensation. And you can see in a study from 2016, going back to that, where some of the layman perceptions where, you know, blacks have thicker skin, things like that actually permeated into the medical culture 
and affected some of the decision making, the medical decision making of actual physicians. Um, and then you can even see up until 2019 how in a peer reviewed study. So going back to how we first started this conversation in 2005, there had studies talking about, you know, blacks just need to perceive their pain differently. Going all the way to 2019, there was a journal review with 42 different articles that were reviewed and 35 were found to have evidence of implicit bias. Um, so this is just to highlight how slowly um, people are identifying that this implicit bias exists and how long um, blacks and people of color suffer from this. So that's it for my discussion and thanks for sitting with me. I hope you were able to digest all that. Thank you, Lauren. Love it. All right, moving on to case two. Uh... Charles will be presenting that. Hi everyone, so this is case number two. Um, you are a 30 year old Hispanic woman who was recently given birth. On uh, nearly four weeks since childbirth, you, have had not, you haven't had much energy and you have had trouble sleeping at night. Though you were excited about becoming a first time mother during pregnancy, you found that your enthusiasm has been waning and you don't feel an intimate connection with your newborn. So because of this, you decided to schedule an appointment with your gynecologist. Next slide, please. So the next, you, when you come to schedule an appointment, you notice that the next available appointment is actually four weeks from now and that the closest um, clinic available, what will you do? So A, we say uh, we make the appointment and endure your symptoms for a little longer. B, we try calling another facility, though the next closest clinic is over an hour away. And, or C, do nothing. Uh, these are just pregnancy blues and you think you can handle it. Now, see, each of these options, it, it, it's you can clearly see that uh, neither of them is essentially the best option. I, I, I want to, of course, give you guys a chance to respond, but I also want to want to illustrate how uh, minorities and often uh, people in um, desperate situations are uh, uh, people who have disparities. They often are they are forced to choose between a lesser of two evils or even three evils in this case. So I just want you guys to have those, bear those things in mind when you're picking options as well. Next question, next slide. So you decide to make an appointment with, a, with the distant clinic, which has an opening for the next day. You arrive at your appointment and you're soon triaged by a nurse who seems to be in a rush. The nurse quickly asks you for a brief overview of symptoms, cutting your answer short to the next question. Uh, when she asked you for your current medication list, you struggle to remember the name of your medication you took during the pregnancy for high blood pressure. The nurse remarks that you should keep better tracks of what's going on in your body and that if you had taken better care of yourself, you could have prevented the hypertension. Next slide. So, so here's a, another question. The nurse finishes the triage. She walks into your room. After several minutes, the physician comes in to see you. You explain your symptoms again. You emphasize that you prefer a non-pharmacological -pharma approach to treatment as you are concerned about the side effects. However, the physician emphasizes that pharmacological treatment alongside uh, therapy would be a better choice. She pulls up a few studies to explain why, but then this seems to become a bit complicated and you don't understand the research results. How do you respond? So as, as like before, you guys can go ahead and uh, you know, put your, your answers to these questions in the chat. I think these are kind of, we want to just get you thinking a little bit about, or, or if you can, just try to put yourself in the uh, patient's position and just wonder, given all these circumstances, especially being explained um, research as a patient who doesn't have any scientific, who doesn't have any science background and just wondering what's going on and you already have anxiety about your pregnancy, just imagine um, what may be going through her head at this time. Next slide, please. You're given a prescription for a sertraline, uh, a refill for methyl dopa, and a referral for psychotherapy. However, the psychotherapy is completely virtual and you do not have access to technology that allows for video conferencing. What will you do? Next slide. Uh, so for the discussion portion, we just want to go over a few bullet points just to kind of get you guys thinking a little bit more and uh, engage you a bit. So a 30-year-old Hispanic woman, she's a 30-year-old Hispanic woman experiencing major depressive disorder with peripartum onset. Appointment with primary care physician isn't available. There's patient shaming involved. Um, the concern is that the side effects were not really addressed 
and use of technical language instead of layman's terms. Um, the, uh, there's a maternity desert, meaning that she has impaired access to medical care. Uh, if there's difficulty, the, the facilities are often an hour away, and there's limit, limitations to uh, telehealth. So with these sort of things, we can realize how how uh, these factors are, are impactful and contribute to, to patient care, especially to um, people who, like I said before, who are at a disadvantage. Can you uh, imagine, for example, being placed in a position where you have to decide between the best care and the closest care, or the best care and the, the most readily available care? These are things that often I feel like are overlooked in the healthcare community, especially when, or no care at all, absolutely. Are overlooked in the uh, healthcare community among people who you know don't have access to these sorts of things. And another thing uh, specific to COVID nineteen and and things having been moved to telehealth is the um, lack of access to um, technology. You know, I think that sometimes we feel like just because uh, things are over the internet or via we, we 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 can have these appointments at home that we've alleviated the sort of stress that comes with traveling to appointments. But we don't recognize that some, oftentimes not everyone has uh, these technological advances or even is technology savvy. And so that presents another challenge within itself. Um, something to, or even, yeah, transportation as well. So I think that that's something that definitely needs to be examined. That's something I want you all, all of you guys to keep in mind as you hear these cases as well. All right, and we have, thank you, Charles. We have our last case. And then um, as um, uh, Rashida is presenting this last case, for anyone who has questions on the panel, it could be about the cases or it can just be regular questions. You can start typing them now so we can answer that after. All right, Rashida. Sorry. All right, so for our last case, uh, you are a 28 year old Muslim woman from India visiting family in New Jersey. Three days after your arrival, you develop a moderate fever of 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit and increased pressure and pain below your eyes. This quickly progresses to a throbbing headache and purulent nasal discharge. Your symptoms are increasingly uncomfortable and over-the-counter medicine does little to abate your symptoms. It is late at night and most clinics are closed, so your cousin offers to drive you to a local urgent care clinic. There we go. So for the first question, you're at the clinic and your cousin speaks with the receptions for you. Though you are fluent in Bengali and can understand some English, you, the patient, are unable to communicate in English. The uh, your cousin tells you that the receptionist has scheduled you with the next available physician who is male. However, for cultural reasons, you prefer a female physician. So what will you do? Ask me to type which answers in each chat. I'm seeing a couple of A's. A lot of A's. Okay. So many of you are saying to ask the receptionist to change the appointment to the female position, even though this can be a long wait. All right, so let's see what our patient does. So your cousin tries to change the appointment to the female position, but, but the receptionist says that she has stopped accepting patients for the night. Uh, and unfortunately, this is pretty common. After a certain time, the physician may just cut off the number of patients that they're seeing. Uh, so you reluctantly keep your current appointment and are soon ushered into a room. However, your cousin leaves to use a restroom. Moments later, the physician comes in and asks you what is wrong. You try to speak, but the physician quickly cuts you off and says he cannot understand you. So what will you do? So one person said A slash B, another said C. So we need more Bs and a couple more Cs. Okay. So many of you are saying to try to use a language interpreter app or just to wait for your cousin to return. So let's see what happens. So you just try to download an interpreter app, but you're unable to connect to the Wi-Fi. You can see that the physician is growing visibly impatient and begins to feel anxious. Just then your cousin walks in. A brief discussion ensues between them and you overhear the physician say she should really learn some English. As he begins the patient interview, you notice the physician never once looks in your direction and only looks at your cousin to ask questions. When a physician attempts to perform a physical exam, you refuse, again, for those cultural reasons we mentioned earlier. You can sense the physician's frustration, which increases your discomfort. In question three, so after the appointment concludes, the physician writes your prescription for augmentin, 250 milligrams, a chewable tablet to be taken every eight hours. 
However, you are aware that many tablet forms of antibiotics contain animal product derivatives that you cannot consume. So what will you do? Right away, someone said A. Two more A's. Okay. So many of you are saying to ask the physician to change prescription, even though you're uncomfortable because of the physician's attitude towards you. Um, honestly, I think I would do the same. So self-advocacy, I think, is the best choice here. So you decide to obtain the liquid form, and your cousin asks the physician to change the prescription to the liquid of medicine. The physician initially argues that the liquid form is for adults with dysphagia or difficulty swallowing only, but you insist. The physician begrudgingly changes the prescription. On your way out of the clinic, you hear, hear him mutter something about difficult patients. Okay, so as a discussion, again, this was a 28-year-old Muslim Indian woman, and she was having acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. So from the very beginning, there were issues. We had a same gender physician was not available, and this is typically preferred by Muslim patients, um, but unfortunately, this is not always uh, given to them. Interpreter services were not offered. So as physicians, we are supposed to use um, an interpreter service. Family member interpreters are not preferred, um, but and even if one wasn't available in this setting, one was never offered to begin with. And uh, again, another point, magnesium stearate and antibiotics. So as I mentioned, many tablet forms of antibiotics contain magnesium stearate and gelatin, both of which may be derived from animal products such as pork. Um, Muslims it, it are unable to consume uh, pork products. And so in, in this case, uh, they would need another type of antibiotic or perhaps a liquid form. And the physician was very um, dismissive of her request and was not understanding of that at all. And the physician also, uh, as, as a question, difficult patient or difficult physician, I want you guys to try to answer in the chat. I personally think the physician was being very difficult. I don't know if you guys remember seeing, I think it was just a few months ago, there was a white physician that was getting aggravated and this encounter was videotaped. He was getting aggravated and angry at a Hispanic patient because she couldn't speak English. And he remarked to her that she should know English because she's been in this country for as long uh, as she has. Um, and that's just such erroneous thinking. Um, you know, a per a English may not be a person's first language, but that doesn't guide your judgment or your medical judgment. Um, so that kind of blatant racism, unfortunately, is very common. And um, we keep seeing that. All right. And I just want to give a quick thanks to Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Schmutz because uh, they reviewed the cases after I wrote them. And these are my references. Thank you so much, Rashida. Rashida put that together herself uh, along with the doctors giving approval. So we do thank you um, for doing this for us. Um, now, this part of the session is where we get real. Um, this is what most you know, I think emphasize part uh, simply because you want to hear from our student doctors, hear about their experiences, and also for uh, the people that are attending, whether they're student doctors as well, you know, um, future student doctors or current doctors. Uh, I think in this climate, especially with Corona and everything that's going on racially in the world, um, we want to hear from you. So I have a couple statistics of my own. The first one, um, as you see, we have. Um, two black males and uh, three black, black females on the panel. So there's only 6.1% black men in medical school. Double AMC that was posted as the current enrollment as of 2020 through 2021 year. 6.1%, that's 2,700 out of 45,000 black men. And that number has gone up over the last three years. Um, so it was lower than that. So this year is the big year, but it was lower than that, right? 9.1% are black female out of 48,000. That number has gone up as well, but it's still 9%. Um, so with that, I guess my first question would be, let's um, let's start with the women. Um, being part of that 9.1%, congratulations to all of you, first of all. Um, and second of all, how does that make you feel? Because it's just a statistic, but you're actually enduring it. You're actually experiencing it, you know? So, that 9% of your class, if you're 200 in the class, you know what I'm saying? You're approximately 10% of that. So how does that impact you as you walk around in your school? And how do you feel when um, you don't see as many people that look like 
um, we can start off with the women. That's okay. Yeah, I can start on that. Um, I think when I think about like going into certain spaces for me to not see faces that look like me or even like skin colors or um, hair textures, it just makes me a little bit more cognizant that I need to have like a heightened awareness of who else is in the room with me, what else is around me, um, to be aware that I might be asked to be the one to represent an entire entity of people. And um, even amongst my own household, my siblings and I, we all do not think the same at all. So it just puts an extra weight and um, added pressure of like this unnecessary um, strive for excellence and perfection. Not gonna say excellence, I would say perfection. So I think it just adds extra stress. Um, but to that point, I've also been in these types of environments for a really long time. And I think my first time transitioning from a predominantly um, African American and Hispanic population to a predominantly Caucasian um, or European descent Anglican <laughs> um, population was in elementary school. And that was when I really started learning how to adjust in these types of environments. So I definitely agree with that. Um, so on the one hand, I'm very grateful to be added, to be a member of that very small statistic. Um, you know, I'm happy to at least help contribute to the growing numbers of Black women that are becoming doctors. But on the other, on the other hand, there is a lot of pressure. Um, you know, there is a pressure to be representative, you know, to be uh, the Black spokesperson for all Black people. Um, and I try to remind myself, you know, I can only be representative of myself. I can share the best of my traits as, um, you know, as a marker of what Black people are constantly expected to do. But at the end of the day, I can only represent myself, you know, and, and I try to not let the weight of everyone's expectations, those that want to see me succeed and those that expect me to fail to um, kind of, you know, affect how I move through, you know, these spaces. That's what I would have to say. Thank you all for your answers. Um, for a quick on my perspective on that, agreeing with Chloe and Rashida on those points, but also emphasizing, uh, Rashida said that, you know, she has to be self-representative for um, sakes of, as we can say, mental health, you know? Uh, that's something mentally that it's always there, but you can't always pay attention to it, you know? So you are the representative, but you can't always think like that because it's already very hard to be in medical school as is. So that added stress, you know what I'm saying? You feel like you have to, but then you feel like you can't. Um, and for me personally, sometimes I, I feel a little guilt that, um, am I not doing my best to represent, you know, like, am I not going to every event that I should to show a black face or show that there's black people in this class or, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I can't, as Rashida said, and Chloe was speaking to, it's hard to be that one for everyone where as in the white population, it can be anyone, but for us, it has to be all of us. So, you know, we get stuck with having to attend every event to make sure that there's one in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? That can become a little overwhelming, especially with all of the pressure. All right, um, for the black males, um, especially with Melvin and Charles, I believe we have five or six in our current class at Rowan SOM, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so out of five or six out of 211, how do you feel? I'll go first. Um, I put it in the chat like a unicorn. Like it's really rare that you see any one of us. It's extremely ir ironic and hilarious that me and Charlie look almost identical. Because people definitely call me Charlie. I mean, in our in our black group, like I'm not going to hold you. We have a running joke. Like it's Charlie Melvin, Melvin Charlie. Like we, we don't even call each other Charlie and Melvin anymore. I call him Melvin. Like so, I mean. It, it is what it is. In society, it happens. Like we all look alike. It's a running joke, but at the same time, it's it's a it's a big deal to not have that kind of representation. Like you kind of feel like you want to have a, a type of unity or people that you can identify with. And even between like African and African American, like there's even that kind of weird separation because a lot of that men in medical school are not African American like me and Charlie. A lot of them are African. And they have a whole separate culture, like separate subset of different things that they believe and in ways that they view me, people like me and Charlie. So um, it's definitely hard. You really feel isolated, but you, you really got to make the best out of a bad situation. 
Yeah, to add to that, I think um, the, the, the key word and a lot of what Melvin was saying is that the experience is, is, is truly isolating. I think um, at times you, you spend, and, and as to piggyback off of Adrian and Rashida as well, I think you spend a lot of time understanding that you are in the minority. And so you want to live in a space where you can uh, woefully represent uh, other minorities. And you want, I, I myself, especially, I, I find it, I find intensified pressure in wanting to perform so that I am viewed as a minority that can perform so that we are, are when admissions committees and they see other minorities, they don't have necessarily these lapses in thought and, and, and they, they leave with the impression that, you know, minorities have a, an extended amount of difficulty or, or you know, they are impacted by these experiences. I, I don't think that oftentimes that they understand that um, minorities are faced with an, an added amount of pressure simply by being, we don't have the support. You know what I mean? We look to our left and we look to our right. And, and of course we stick together, but sometimes we get lost in the crowd. You know what I mean? We get lost in, in, in everyone else's culture and in an attempt to assimilate, sometimes we lose ourselves. So sometimes there's trouble, you know, it's a, it's a complex situation truly to be um, a minority and, and an African-American, particularly in these situations. I think that um, it goes without saying that, you know, it goes without saying that we, in, in order to, to to be as strong as possible, we try to stick together, but it, you know, it's, a, it's an added amount of pressure for sure. Thank you guys. This next question, um, I personally came up with, but I want to know you guys' opinion, right? So you're in medical school, you are all second years, which means you passed first year, you know, and you've made it this far. Um, but how does it make you feel that you may be viewed as a quota? So, the we all know that every school if we're being real every school has a quota they need to meet for minority population in the school right and everyone in this chat worked their butt off to get here and i don't feel like a quota you know what i'm saying like i definitely feel like i worked and i deserve to be here and, and proving that daily and i know you all as well so how does that make you feel knowing that or does that put extra pressure on you to perform better um, or feel like you need to outperform everyone else simply because you're black and you want to prove that you're here for a reason and not here because they needed you. So that's free for all for whoever wants to speak on that. Yeah, I think I, mean, I, I think um no, yeah, I think um as I was saying before, I think that is an added amount of pressure, even with that idea of of being a part of a quota you want as you know we we talk amongst ourselves about wanting to increase the number of us of number of minorities so that we aren't necessarily a minority and so in doing that we understand that there are statistics that have to be met there there are, are uh, you know boxes that have to be checked and if we perform mentally you think if we perform and if we perform well that somebody has to see that we are an asset to this school outside of a number you know what I mean? Outside of a, a statistic or a box or a category you could check so that you can say that a university is quote unquote diverse. You know what I mean? And so a part of that, you know, it's 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 added intensity and we bring to I think that we live in that space every day and it's tough. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree with that. And living in that space requires that you go twice as hard just to be seen or equal to your classmates. And that's a hard part because when you live under that type of pressure it, it always feels like any little setback is the worst that ever happened and any victory is just marginalized and you always feel marginalized um so from that perspective like that that idea of a quota it, it's not even something that i think about in in terms of saying it that way but it's something that that pressure i feel definitely in every every day that i'm in school is that pressure that i have to perform because i'm a selected few um so and, and that's tough, but to to feel like I'm here to fill a quota now, that 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 part is, I think, someone else's superimposed idea, and and it's just like a, frankly, it's just like a colonialist idea. Yeah, I can definitely add to that. I think, um, I've heard it said multiple times to me at various times since I've been here and in my previous institution, um, 
where say like I was on the track team, like I ran track while being a pre-med and I was told multiple times like, oh, you got in here because you ran track. And it's like, nah, I actually got in here on an academic scholarship and I'm running track because I choose to, whether I go to nationals or not. So I think you're aware of people saying that you are a number or you're needed in this place or you're a statistic, but in actuality, as everyone has kind of said, like we've worked so hard to get here. We've overcome so many things. At this point, I don't see myself as a statistic, as a quota, as a number, I see myself as a person who is taking up space just like anybody else. I see someone who's trying to achieve goals, who's trying to, you know, care for those who I want to care for ultimately. And I think, like Melvin said, there's an awareness of, you know, if I walk into a room and there's 60 people and I am the only um, female of color, I'm aware, but I'm not thinking, okay, that makes me, you know, point whatever percent of the population. No, 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 I'm not aware. I take up space just like anybody else. And I think that it's important to um, have that awareness sometimes in terms of, I would even necessarily say like safety emotionally or mentally, but we are more than a number. We are more than a statistics. So just to add to that, um, my first impression of the quota, first of all, is that's way too small. It, I think there should definitely be more of us at this institution and at other schools. But personally, um, I don't think of myself as, as a quota or meeting the black, quote unquote, black count. Um, you know, like everyone else in this panel and everyone else at this school, I did work hard to get here. However, the concern I do have is how other people perceive me in terms of the quota. Do other people look at me and say, oh, you're here because you're Black, or you're here because they took pity on you, or you're just here because they wanted to diversify their class and call themselves a diverse school. Um, and I don't think, um, you know, that's necessarily, I don't think that's accurate at all. But again, my concern is just, is this what other people think when they look at me? Are they judging me by my merits, or are they judging me by the fact that I'm just adding another color to the school. And to speak to that, Rashida, um, you said you at your merits, right? But let's talk about failures and it doesn't have to be exactly failures. It's just mishaps, slip ups, you know, bad day, bad quiz, bad assignment, whatever that may be. Um, in regards to connection to being able to speak about that, how do you guys feel mental health wise? Like, do you feel like there's people that look like you to speak to, you know, um, the services provided by Rowan SOM, as well as every other school that's represented here today. Um, I want you guys to speak to, if it's not hitting you personally, but speak to those in the chat who may, you know what I'm saying, be experiencing that. Um, so how do you feel as far as um, having faculty or someone that you can speak to in times where you do slip up without it feeling like a, I told you so, you know what I'm saying? Like, a, it was expected. Like, do you feel comfortable? Is basically my question. I to look to this first. I mean, because in PBO, like, our facilitators are, they are direct. They're very one-to-one -one with us. So they treat us like their peers and their equals. Um, amongst a lot of the other administration, it's a little more distant because you only see these people probably once a week or for an hour or two or so at a time, not even face to face. They're looking at 100 of y'all, y'all look the same, um, especially when you look like us. Again, that joke is very real. Um, they will call me Charlie. <laughs> um, so the, the, the main point is like you have to try and like identify those allies. Again, like I was saying, it's hard to identify those allies like Dr. Fertal is a great one. Um, we just got a recent director of DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's new to our campus, and she's a super duper ally, even for people with disabilities. Like I'm the diversity liaison, and she's asking me, like, are you guys accommodating people with disabilities? I didn't even think about that, like hearing impairments, wheelchair impairments, like that. So um, again, it's just a matter of identifying these people, but feeling comfortable and disclosing, especially academic stuff. I don't think almost any med school med student feel comfortable doing that, let alone us, because there's always that like, aha, I told you so moment. Like we always, like I said, that pressure of doing 200% just so when you kind of have a messed up, you, you're normal, is very real. Yeah, I think, I, I think it, so we, so we have, we have a limited number of spaces, as you said, or people in particular, like um, to, to speak to about those sort of things. But I think it is true that as a medical student there, as a medical student, generally there's added pressure to perform in a certain way. So you don't always necessarily feel comfortable with your failures or your or you're just not your lack your lapses in perfection. 
um, essentially. And I, and I think when you when you're in a space where there's a limited number of you, there's an intensified pressure there. So you you think about there being twelve of us, and then there are instances where where one of us doesn't do well, or or, or a host of us doesn't do well, and we want to talk to each other, but sometimes we feel in a way that man, we got to perform because if we're, if we're not performing, it's a, they're looking at us, you know, it's, it's easier to see, it's easier to see somebody you can identify in the crowd, you know what I mean? That's not doing well or that hasn't done well or that made a mistake. And so we recognize that we, we and I keep saying that we live in that space, but it's literally, it's literally a, 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 a an idea of constantly living in that space where we know that we have to perform. So now that I've made a mistake, am I a, Am I a minority African American student has made a mistake, or am I a medical student that has made a mistake, or am I a person that has made a mistake in an intensified pressure situation? So I think we run through all these scenarios in our head sometimes, and it's, and it's tough. I think um, it goes without saying that it, it's it's a it's a great deal of pressure for sure. Um, I definitely agree with that. You know, as far as academic mistakes go, everyone all medical students make academic mistakes. No one's perfect, you know, and I, whenever I make a mistake on a quiz or an exam or I get a grade, I didn't think I did as well as, or if I um, perform and didn't do as well as I would have hoped, you know, I really share that with my friends. But as far as identifying a faculty member, um, I think as Melvin said, it's kind of hard to try and find a faculty member that you can connect with and talk to. You know, we're just a couple of students out of over 200 in our class, you know, and all of these students are well, not necessarily competing, but you know, they're all vying for the attention, the guidance, and the advice from these faculty members. So it is trying, it's kind of difficult to get that one-on-one -on -one at times. Yeah, and just to add to what all my colleagues are saying, I think for me, I've noticed that when, like Rashida was saying, if I have a level of performance that's not as great as I would like, or say if I even do better than I was expecting to do, what I've started doing, I think is more so for my mental health and for my peace is going back and reflecting, like, how did I get here? Um, whether it was good or bad. And if I find a confident that I can um, talk to, I will reach out to those people. The people who I usually reach out to are very aware. Um, Dr. Chanel is definitely one of them that I can ask about, um, especially since she's in charge of our curriculum. There are other faculty members that I do find um, used to be accessible, I would say, or used to be more accessible prior to COVID. But I think with COVID, it's definitely made it harder to coordinate schedules. And you would think because of having connects or Zoom that it's easier to just like click and, you know, make a connection. But I found that it has been more um, difficult and it's been a little bit more challenging to try to find those. And lastly, I'll say one thing that's difficult is the pace of medical school Sometimes you don't even have time to reflect on the fact that, oh, I messed up here because there's another practical, there's another quiz, there's another test, there's another, you know, assignment due. It's like you don't sometimes have the time to catch your breath and to go back and reflect. And by the time you want to reflect, you have 20, 30, 40 mistakes that you're going to reflect on. So it's it's definitely a difficult um, thing to do in terms of like managing your time and then finding the right people that you feel comfortable with that can respond to you in, I would say, urgency. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, guys. And to add to that from a personal standpoint, um, I feel everything that everybody else on this panel feels on almost probably a more regular basis than most. And Charlie, you can speak to that um, simply because I like I feel like I, I take everything in. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I take it all in. Um, for instance, hanging out with my classmates, you know, if I'm with my white classmates, we get along with everyone. But I'm always in that mindset of like, oh, when these people, for instance, certain circumstance that happened this week when I'm with the group and I'm the you know only black or there's only two of us and there's six of them and they're like, oh, you guys are medical students? Oh, all of you? And it's like, why did you ask that? What was the all of you about? Was it because I'm here? You know what I'm saying? Like, why was it all of you? Because if it was six white students, would you say, are all of you medical students when the one person speaks and say, hey, we're medical students? You know what I'm saying? So it's always a slight thought in the back of your mind. And as I forgot who spoke to it, but as all of us have basically spoke to it, it's like, Sometimes I even catch myself if I do really well on a, a test or an assignment, 
And I'm like, oh, I did well. And I'm like, yeah, you did well. <laughs> of course. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> You're here. You know what I'm saying? And it's because what we see on CNN, ABC, NBC, Fox, you know what I'm saying? Everything that you hear, things that are going on, all the racial injustices, all the killings, all of this, and all the deaths, um, as uh, if anybody was in the pregnancy meeting last, like, you know, hearing about Black women dying at pregnancy. We just got out of our repro block hearing about preeclampsia and help syndrome and all of these things. It kind of scares you a little bit because as we've all spoke to, it's, it's pressure, you know, and you want to help everyone, but we're only one person and you also have to help yourself because mental health is important for self, but you feel like you're doing this for everyone. Like, and lastly, I feel like I've heard it so many times since I've gotten here. Um, if someone like my mother is very proud to tell everybody I'm in medical school and I hear her friends saying like, please keep going, we need you. You know, that term is used so often. We need you guys, please. We need more of you, we need to see it. And it hurts and touches my heart at the same time. It puts extra pressure, of course, but it hurts because it's being recognized now nationally. You know, it's not just something that we know. It's not just the quota, it's not just the number anymore. Nationally, we're seeing deaths where it's rising. You know what I'm saying? The injustices are coming from the surface. It's no longer, it's it's over. You know what I'm saying? Like, so now that everything is on the surface, as a medical student, I feel like that pressure can be added, um, you know, especially being a small count in a large space. Um, and then finally, making sure as a double minority, as a black and a woman, um, that I'm not a nurse. And there's nothing against being a nurse. There's nothing against DPNs, PAs, DOs, MDs, none of that. But I'm trying to contribute my education and my, you know, like my life to doing what you want to do as well. I'm trying to help just like you. Um, so if I tell you what I am, accept that, you know, don't try to minimize it. Don't try to change it. If I say I'm DO, don't say MD. If I say I'm a doctor, don't say nurse. You know what I'm saying? Take it for what I told you that it was. And then going in that, um, to finish that off, uh, we are going to now start the questions from the chat. So Darlene's gonna read those. And I think that kind of ricochets into the first question. So Darlene. Okay, so the first question is, what are some of your experiences during rotations in regards to racism and discrimination? Um, I will say that we haven't started rotations just yet, but we will be very soon. Um, however, um, we have done our preceptorships or most of us, so maybe you guys can speak on that. I mean, from the Black Collective's perspective, we're a student alumni organization, so some of our members include current physician, and they've experienced on their rotation, their continued medical education career, as well as um, going out into residencies and fellowships, plenty of different communities. Um, so within the communities you treat, you'll experience different patients and people. So of course you might experience racism there, but certainly within their peers and um, trainees, like their clinical trainees um, that, you know, teach them in the hospital, they've experienced slights and different indignations that necessarily wouldn't occur if, if they weren't a minority. And just put it that way. And it's not just black. It's it, I posted on my Instagram the other day about using the word oriental because one of my Asian friends um, was I didn't know, one of one of her attendings called her an oriental, and she was like, "No, I'm I'm Korean. <laughs> That's not you know." So um, it, you, you're going to encounter people from different generations. Some of these doctors are 78 years old, and, and it happens. So, yeah. Yeah. Um as they said we didn't start rotations that's like four months but i think the um pre-pressure is again what we've kind of been speaking to um that i don't want to be singled out or i don't want to be asked questions i know rotations are going to be hard but i don't want it to be extra hard just because i'm black and they want to test my abilities and my skills so that's like a it's not major um concern but it's definitely a thought in your mind because you just know who you are and know what you're, you're capable of but it's still a thought of like, I don't know, it's just all the time in the back of your mind of like, why are you asking me this? You know, it's like, you're always suspicious, but yeah. Okay, so the next question is, do you guys find it difficult to find non-Black allies in your spaces who will support you and or fight for important racial issues in medicine?
I could start on this one. Um, yes and no. I think um, more recently that I've been finding allies, as you would say it, from from school, like in school, um, outside of school. But sometimes I find that it's a trend for them. It's a fad for them. It's a season for them. And they'll come and go. They'll support me, you know, when it makes them look good or they'll support me when it's beneficial back to them. But the reality is, is that support is always needed. And I find that it's difficult to find people who can be as passionate about what we are experiencing in actuality because we it's hard to share that perspective um, with other students where you try to explain to them, say you walked into a room and you're like, did you notice that, you know, everyone was looking in this direction and they're like, nah, it's that's not a real thing. I think you're you're overdoing it. Um, or when you ask um, for students to say support you with a certain cause, they're like, oh, no, that's not for me. That's for you and your friends. And it's like, OK, so are you are you really for me in the sense of when, when it when you have to go out of your way to help me to do something or are you for me because it's the trend on social media because it's the hashtag because it's the current you know um social unrest and i think that's something that i really struggle with um with finding people consistently that can relate to me authentically i i agree totally with um chloe's sentiment i think um especially given that we, we've been afforded an opportunity, well, I don't know if it's an opportunity, but we've been afforded um, a chance to be present in, in medical school during a time where we're before, like, post it, well, we're currently in the pandemic, but before the pandemic and all of the, the big, the, the big sort of uh, new civil rights movement that has happened with the killing. And so we, so we've noticed in our first year, the sort of support we got or didn't get, you know what I mean? And post that we saw the difference. So it just, it, even in seeing a difference, you kind of think of what were you guys thinking about before? Or you kind of think about what, what did we look like before? Or what, how did our presence make you feel before? So sometimes you feel that and it's, and it's tough because I think that um, um, uh, race and I think that and those sort of things that that people don't always know what to say. So there's trouble in that. And you have to identify that on a human level and understand that not everyone knows what to say or how to help or how to support. And so you have to be understanding in that sort of thing. And there's matters even on the outside of me or on the outside of race that I don't even know how to approach or support or be there for. So I, I, I would hope that people don't hold me to, you know, a stricter standard in that way as, as you know, as, as we sometimes look at it, but like I said, being a part of this experience, or being a part a part of the minority experience, is is being in a state of always wondering why now, or why this way, or why so, or or is it genuine? Is what the toughest thing is to even identify whether or not something is genuine. Because even though you may offer me support, if I don't think it's genuine, I don't even want to engage. You know what I mean? There's fear there. There's apprehension there, and so um, that that's essentially my point. I think that um, we've all been privy to to that space where we've been able to see uh, how people approached us before all these things happened and how people are approaching us now. So it's just given us a, a space to kind of really examine those sort of reactions and sort of the presence or, or the help from people at the university. So I agree with that as well. Um, and that yes and no, I sometimes have non-white people that do or non-black people that do support me. Um, I'm fortunate in that I have a friend group that is very uh, understanding and I'm very frank with them about my blackness and how I am and they are very receptive of that. Or some things, something that I do notice when I got into the community, for example, is uh, white people tend to be a support system when they find out, when they find out you know, what I am. You know, if I, people ask me, oh, what do you do? What are you studying? And I say, I'm a medical student. And all of a sudden, you know, they perk up and they're like, oh, you're a student, you're a smart, you know, you're a, an educated black person. Ergo, I must respect you more compared to someone else, uh, compared to someone else. So as far as authenticity goes, you know, uh, white people or non-black people, rather, um, they may be authentic with their perceptions of one type of black person and then inauthentic with, their, with regards to their perceptions of another type of black person. So it's inconsistent there. So off of that last point that Rashida made, I think again, yes and no. Um, and 
based on perception, I think it changes sometimes who I am, you know, um, there are some people at Rowan SOM. We have great students. Don't get me wrong, especially my class. Personally, that's what I can speak to. Um, and I have friends who are white who understand and they're great. You know what I'm saying? Um, and around them, I feel like I can be honest and I tell them exactly how I feel. And again, Charlie can speak to this. I'm, 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 I'm black. <laughs> like I'm just a medical student, you know, so I don't like to change my persona to fit into what a medical student looks like. I'm just black. I like what I like. I do what I do outside of school. You know what I'm saying? Respectfully. And then I come to school and I do what I'm supposed to do. And I think that I should be able to have those two elements and not feel like I have to change them. I don't feel like I should have to change my Ebonics or my lingo or my, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a, if I'm respectful and I'm being professional, why should I have to feel like I have to fit in? Why is fitting in fitting out for me? You know what I'm saying? Like, why is that a thing? So as far as allies, those people who do respect that and respect me as such, that's appreciated. And then as everyone else was saying, there are some where you feel like you have to sometimes tone it down. You know what I'm saying? You don't, it's America. We don't have the same opinions as many politically, religiously, you know what I'm saying? Like on any topics and that's okay. And we accept that. Um, but as they said, you got to be careful and you want to make sure that it's authentic because I don't want to give myself to you and open up about my feelings. And you just did it to post it on Instagram and then I don't hear from you again. You know what I'm saying? George Floyd was killed and it's like, hey, how are you going? I know a lot has been going on. And then I never heard from you again when it happened to the next person or the next person. You know what I'm saying? Or when we have these meetings, I know there's a question about that at Rowan about diversity or about social injustice. You're not there. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, did you really care? You know, do you really want to change um, or help the change? I'm not saying that they're the person that's wrong, but do you really want to be a part of that change or do you want to be a part of that trend? Amazing answers to everybody. I totally agree. Um, the next question is, is there anything we can do as your classmates to decrease the stress you feel or to try to help you feel not so isolated? For instance, ways we can be an ally. I think I think um, that the best way to be an ally. I'm, well, I don't really know. I think I think so. That's a complex situation as well. So I think that you at the end of it all, you have to be authentic, you know, as, as they teach us as physicians to care about people. Now, now remove remove my skin and I'm a person just as you, right? So first and foremost, that's what matters. If if you if you knew of people who are are are, are being impacted by a struggle or if you knew of a people who were just 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 in a tough moment or a tough scenario or a tough situation regardless of who those people were, you would want to have some sort of compassion. And compassion would just make you want to Hey, how you doing? When we, when we, for example, as medical students, as a collective, on exam day or even exam week, when we're all in school, we walk past each other. Everybody says, "Good luck." Oh man, yeah, I know it's tough. And and if you can, on that bare bones level, identify with me as a human being, and understand like, yo, I'm struggling, and I, I know that I'm studying a lot, and I know that it's tough. So I know that she's struggling, and I know that it's tough, and I know that he's struggling. So I'm gonna say, "Good luck." I'm gonna say I understand, man. Or, you know, it, it's just at a human level of everything you have to sort of care one, you know, about life, about how people feel, and you know that you experience sadness, you know that you experience depression, you know that things impact you in a way, and so that's all you. If you lead with that, you can't be incorrect. There's, you know, what I mean. If you lead with being genuine, you can't be incorrect, and you may genuinely not care. And that, I'm not saying that that's okay. There's an issue with that. But I'm saying that that is just that's something that you have to seek from within. That's something that you have to approach from within to identify your biases or things that that you struggle with. You know what I mean? And you and you you come to somebody and say, I know you may be going through something. I don't necessarily understand because I've never gone through that. But let me know how I can help you asking a question like you just did. Wh whoever may have posed that question. That's the start of it all. You know what I mean? There's no right answer. I think that. Even sometimes as students, we struggle in wanting to be right all the time. And sometimes that makes us silent. But silence sometimes hurts more than anything else. Don't don't make me feel or don't make a, a people feel like you don't see them because then now we feel like we're struggling 
in isolation, that's all the more troublesome. You know what I mean? I think that that you know, like you said, posing the question is is a perfect start and, and the start of everything, the start of caring for any sort of people is in just being human and understanding that, you know, you go through things as anyone else and leading with that sort of approach. To say say to to keep it really blunt, it's awkward for me just like it's awkward for you. <laughs> like it's awkward for both of us. Like I don't like being in the spotlight all the time. I don't want to black as a black person, you don't want to be a victim. You don't want to have to have people always asking, are you okay? That's annoying. That's like a normal human being, like Charlie was saying, like, you don't want to keep hearing like, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Or, it doesn't feel good. Like, you don't want to be that victim. So I think that that mindset, like, is something that also bothers me. It's like, oh, like, I'm going through some stuff. But I feel like I'm always going through some stuff because there's something always going on. But like, it's my, it's only, I owe it to myself to feel those feelings. You know what I'm saying? Because it's real. So sometimes you try to like, let this person off the hook or let that person off the hook because you're like, I don't want to be annoying. Or I feel like we're talking about being black too much, but like I'm black. So like, accept it. You know what I'm saying? You're white and that's accepted. So why can't I, you know, like, why can't I be me? So it's awkward for me, but to the question of how you can be an ally of what everyone's saying, it's just like, just be authentic and just, work to not be ignorant on the situation you know um and make sure that if you are ignorant it's because you just didn't know not because you just want to accept it you know what i'm saying like you you want to be comfortable in that ignorance because again my most hated phrase is i don't see color because see my color <laughs> i'm black see that respect that understand that we have differences i was raised differently you know what i'm saying and that should be okay because I was raised in America just like you, you know what I'm saying? So that should be okay. But as an ally to my, you know, the, the great people in my life who do um, do a great job, literally all they do is just be themselves as a respectable human being. Um, so for people who may not be of color, it's like your job, don't make it awkward, more awkward on yourself than the situation is for both of us. Just be yourself and be real and be okay with saying, I don't know how to handle this situation. I, I don't know what I should say. I don't know what I can say. And that, like Charlie said, ask the question. Ask me, is it okay if you ask me? You know what I'm saying? Ask me if we can speak about it. Ask me, do I want to talk about it at this time? And you don't have to do that on a daily basis, but when, when you feel it in your heart, just it'll come out as genuine as you need it to be. So if you're a genuine person, you'll have no problem with that. Yeah, I definitely wanna echo what um, Adrian said. I think sometimes people just forget to try to initiate and to establish connection. Um, as a first generation Nigerian American, I've traveled to various countries for mission trips before and people are like, why would you go to Myanmar? You don't even know anybody on the continent of Asia. And I'm like, it's about connection. It doesn't matter if they're a child, it doesn't matter if they're elderly, it doesn't matter if they're orphaned, it doesn't matter if they are widowed, it doesn't matter. If you are breathing and you have the ability to connect with someone, there is a way and a like a time and a space to connect with that person. And when you take the time to connect and you take the time to get to know their perspective, get to know their viewpoint, you just are. And you, you doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't even matter if you speak the same language. I've made connections with kids in languages where I don't even speak their language, but because we understand the authenticity and we appreciate like a life, we can connect with each other. You don't have to have the same skin color as me. You don't have to have the same, you know, educational background as me. You don't have to have the same religion as me. There is abilities for us to all connect. And I think the thing is, is that sometimes it can be really uncomfortable. It can be really awkward. You try to find that way to connect. But if there's a way, you can do it. And I think if you connect to me on, on nothing else other than we're both in medicine, great. That's the standing point. By the time we have a 20 minute conversation, we'll realize that we like the same movies. We like the same color. We want to get the same new Jordans coming out. I personally don't want Jordans, but I'm just making it as an example. Like, you know, you'll find that you have more things in common, but you have to be willing to start and to cross that bridge um, and not just put all of the pressure and weight on us to try to relate and find something that you know, that you do that I do as well. I think by mere fact that we're in the same spaces, we just need to find a way to connect within those spaces. And like Adrian said, not make it awkward. Not like, hey, how are you? Are you okay? Like you're, you're putting pressure on me to just like say something back to you. It's more of just like, you know, we're sitting in classes and maybe you're an OMM if you're an osteopathic student or you're in a chemistry class or whatever. And just, you know, bringing up the conversation of like, you know, how was your day and things like that, you know, so. 
I'm just a piggyback off of what everyone's um, said, and I definitely agree with everything. I think one thing that people can do is when you're coming to me to have a conversation, you know, come with me, come to me with an open mind and as a blank slate, you know, don't have your preconceived notions of what a black person is supposed to be like or what you perceive blackness to be at the forefront of your conversation. Because so more often than not, people get it so wrong. I've uh, encountered, I'm from North Carolina, so back home in North Carolina, um, you know, people make assumptions about how I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to act, what my interests are, and it's just, you know, it baffles me because I don't know where they get these ideas or thoughts from aside from, you know, society. So I think when you're coming to be an ally for Black people or any person of color, you know, we're all individuals. I am Black, but that's not the full story. You know, my skin color doesn't speak for me. I speak for myself. And you can only get to know me by speaking to me, not just by looking at me. Okay, so our last question is, what is your school actively doing to increase the diversity in your class? Uh, great question. I can speak to what we're doing. Um, the school, I mean, for Rowan, at least what I can speak to is we have had a lot of, like I said, social injustice um, conversations and talks over the summer. Um, um with the uh, Rowan undergrad institution as well so that has been spoken about um Melva did mention that we did hire a new diversity um someone in charge of our diversity committee uh, at the school um and I can't really speak to like I said what they're doing but I can speak to what we're doing to hopefully help them do you know so we're asking for more professors that look like us you know we have a few and they're great and they're the directors of the blocks and things of that nature but we're asking for more of those because um, i know there's more black doctors out there we're we're going to these meetings and we're advocating you know for the students who are capable and the students who also may need a chance to get into medical school you know what i'm saying we're making sure that all of us individually are helping mentees to prepare them better you know, so we're doing that that work to try to get them into medical school to help them with their applications. And because sometimes, especially if you come from a underserved community, they don't even know how to do certain things, you know, and it's not a Rowan thing. Let's put that out there. It's not a Rowan thing. It could be a Cooper thing. It could be Ohio State. It could be Czech medical. It could be any school. But the issue is also below us. You know, is it the undergrad institutions? What are they doing to make sure these students are prepared to come to medical school to make it more diverse? You know, so I think as students, that's that's something where we take on as a job as well to help make sure these applicants have great applications to um, add to the diversity of Rowan, at least. So that was our last question. Um, I just wanted to add, um, as a Hispanic female, I find myself in a lot of the shoes that you guys do. And just to reiterate, it's so important to just be genuine. Um, I've connected with each panelist on here in different ways, like individually. So just be yourself, you know, talk to people, ask them about anything. It doesn't have to be about what's going on in society. Just literally anything, and you find yourself connecting with more people than you ever thought. You'd never know what somebody's interests are, what they like to do. And that could be something that you click with, and it could be the start of a great relationship. You know, you don't have to be close with them, but just like seeing, seeing them in the hallway or wherever, like, hey, how are you? I know this block is rough. Um, how are you holding up? Because I know it's been difficult for me. And those are like little ways to just, you know, pitch in in certain ways. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Darlene. Um, and like she said, that was our last question. So um, we are officially done with this, but I definitely want to say thank you to Rashida, Charlie and Chloe and Melvin who had to step into another session. And we did run a little over, but I think we wanted to get our points heard. And I think that you all did a great job. So thank you Kings and Queens for, uh, doing your best at this presentation. And I hope that you all got something out of this or, you know, enjoyed yourself. So thank you so much.
Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. All right. Have a good one. Thank you all for coming. Have a good day.